also introduce some of our speakers who are here. But thanks again for everyone for showing up. If you have any questions, um, feel free to raise your hand during the presentation or uh, afterwards also we'll have some, <coughs> some questions also. Hi, um, my name is Brian and uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming to this seminar in the School of Prison Pipeline. Uh, I'd like to thank Basu for making this possible and I'd also um, like to thank our speakers for giving us their time today. Uh, what you're going to hear about today is the criminalization of school discipline. Now what is that? Well, it's a policy choice that Texas schools are making at a local level to write children tickets and send them to court for disciplinary issues that once would have meant a trip to the principal's office or landing in detention. Now why is that important? It's important because when we write children tickets, we are saddling them with criminal histories that uh, are setting them up for failure because uh, having criminal history makes it difficult to get work. When you uh, send in a job application, you have to disclose that. It makes it difficult to find a place to live because you have to disclose criminal history on an apartment application. It makes it difficult to get an education because it's something you have to disclose on school applications. Um, it's something that a city can set for failure. It's, it's hurting them and it's hurting our communities. And so um, what can we do about it? Well, the first step is um, y'all who came out here today to learn more about what it is and um, the legal processes involved. Uh, helping, helping a kid who's been written a ticket is a small commitment of time for an attorney. It's just a few hours. But it can have a big impact on a person's life. Um, in the short term, we hope to divert kids from the cycle, stop them from going into the pipeline. In the long term, we hope to close off the pipeline entirely. Uh, you may ask if that's feasible. You may ask if that's possible. Of course, the answer to that is C, say quite it. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Alan Weeks, who is director of Austin Voices for Education and Youth. Yeah. So my name is Alan Weeks, uh, director of Austin Voices for Education and Youth. Uh, grateful to be here, grateful to Vasu and uh, Brian for the invitation. I know some of you, I know Tina, and I'll say something more about you in a minute. My talk, you're actually sitting in the talk here, right here. So you're coming up. And um, Adrian Moore does uh, great work as the director of uh, the Council of At-Risk at Youth. Does a great job with, uh, with a lot of the kids we're talking about today. Um, so uh, I'm not an expert in the juvenile justice system. And I know some, you know, I'm around schools all the time. I'm a, I was a teacher for many years. But I'm an expert in the way schools work and don't work. So I'm going to set a little bit of context of why we're in this situation, the kind of systems um, issues that lead to Texas being the, uh, the leader in, in criminalizing youth. Um, NPR had a story, and I haven't checked out the stats, but they had a story I was driving back, uh, back in the spring uh, talking about this national story. And they were saying that 50% of, of Texas youth you know, will, will come out of high school with uh, some sort of criminal record, you know, where they've, they've, they've had a you know, misdemeanor. It might be wiped off the record at some point, but, uh, but an incredibly high number of our kids, um, as, as Brian said, instead of getting a trip to the principal's office, and um, of course in my time there would have been a, uh, a different kind of punishment exerted in the, in the principal's <laughs> office, um, but uh, instead that's being diverted into the courts. And uh, so I want to back up a little bit about the kind of the, the, the context in, in schools today. Um, so there's a debate in our country around school reform. I mean, you hear about it in the elections, you hear about it, you read about it in the paper. It's been movies made about different points of view on how we reform our schools. Even the idea of if our schools are failing is, is up to, you know, is questionable. But, uh, but there's really two sides that I see in the debate. Um, and one side says that, um, that external factors such as poverty, um, they really aren't, uh, don't play a key role as far as influencing a student's academic success. Um, they, down, they downplay poverty saying that, what, that it's all about what happens between eight and three in the, in the school. Um, if the school is a, of high enough quality, then any kid can succeed in that school. Um, so, you know, for them, it's about quality teachers, it's about curriculum, it's about, you know, those kinds of things. You know, reforming those, you can work with any kids as long as it's good. Um, and um, they really, th this side, I want to I say, um, 
wants to keep us out of a couple of traps that, that, that we've had in the past. The one is, is prejudging certain ch children, determining in advance whether they can be successful. Um, you know, if you say poverty is such a big issue, well then you can, you know, they're afraid of us getting to the point where we say that poor kids can't succeed. And so these, these reformers are really, you know, answering that concern, saying no, all kids can succeed. You know, if we have a good enough program, all kids can succeed. Um, and second, these reformers are concerned that resources are taken away from the core academic mission of the school and put into, you know, they don't want to see that and then they're put into social services, which they would see as a black hole. Um, there's, you know, of, of, of uh, you know, society problems that the school can't solve, family supports, all those kind of things. Um, I heard our local superintendent, Dr. Forgione, previous superintendent, say, uh, after midnight at a school board meeting, and that's when things get really honest, because midnight the cameras go off, and it gets really entertaining at the school board after that point. But right after midnight, he said that he did not believe in uh, using social services in the school system um, at all. And he described it as a black hole. He said, it's just endless. Our job's eight to three. And the school board president said to, back to him, he said, you know, I don't think we have that luxury anymore. I think that time has passed when we can do that. They were kind of representing sides of this debate. Now, the other side, of course, uh, of the, the school reform debate has a more holistic view of, of kids and, and working with kids. Um, and it says that you know, child poverty and external factors actually are very important, and you can't help a child succeed without considering those factors. Um, E3 Alliance, which you may have heard of, it's a you know, uh, coalition of, uh, of business, community, and academic groups in Central Texas. Um, they quote studies that say, you know, 50% of the kids' success are determined by external factors. Again, pretty broad thing, and I haven't looked at the study. But, uh, but E3 is a very business-oriented group, and that's the kind of figure they're, they're throwing around, you know, saying that they really do believe external factors have, have, an, have an influence. And um, reformers in this camp really subscribe to having wraparound services at schools, family support, student supports, things like communities and schools, counsel to ask at risk youth, uh, after school programs, a lot of you know a lot of broader things around the school. You know, they say we really need this to, to make to, to have kids successful. Um, and I'll be honest, I personally subscribe to that and, and it, nationally, it's not so much in Texas, nationally it's called the community school movement where schools really are a center of their community and all those factors tend to be weighed in a, uh, in a kid's success. Uh, just on NBC this weekend, they're doing a series on 10 model schools or school movements around the country and they feature, feature the STRIVE program in Cincinnati which has over 100,000 kids in it. Very much of the community school um, theory and having some really good results of this. So this is really the two sides. Do you get into the social services business? Do you get into these out of school factors like homelessness and you know utilities being off and all that, you know, or not? And um, we've tended in Texas to be the or not camp. We've tended to just, you know our job, our state has really put the money and the emphasis on eight to three. Um, and good things have come from that. I think we've really, as Dr. Forgio would also say, we, we have this laser-like focus, you know, really focusing on the academics. And you can get so distracted by trying to help so many different factors that you lose focus on that core academic mission. So Texas has tended to be in that, in that camp. Um, Austin Voices, as I said, you know, the, the, the group I run, we, we tend to be of the more broader community school. Um, Camp and, um, and we've started over the last seven years seven family resource centers over the last five years. Seven family resource centers, school-based wraparound service centers for families. We have a lot of families that um, are not able to get their kids to school ready to learn every day. And let me just, I'm going to back up a minute and tell you how, why we started these centers because five years ago I didn't, I wasn't in the community school camp. I wasn't setting out to, you know, to start a social service movement or, or agency. Um, but we were trying to stop a school from closure over academic issues. Our local middle school, Webb Middle School, is about to close due to academic performance. We led, along with community members, the, the, uh, the, the fight to keep that school open. Um, I'd done a lot of school reform work, school improvement work, so was able to you know, really put together a plan for the board, a kind of turnaround plan for the board, which the school board accepted. They thought it was a great, you know, great plan. 
And uh, part of crafting that plan, in addition to talking to community, mem community members, was I interviewed all the teachers at the school and uh, asked the teachers, what do you think is wrong? A lot of school reformers don't ask teachers uh, what's wrong. But as a teacher, I said, you tell me what's going on here. And one of the three things repeated over and over was our classes are unstable. Uh, we never know. We have kids here for two months, and then they're gone for two months, and then they're back for two months. Because our families are moving a lot. And so I looked up a stat that nobody seemed to mention at that time called school mobility, and they were at 35%. So over there, a third of their kids were highly mobile. Uh, some of them would move, move three or four times in a school year, and they would bounce around cheap rents, uh, domestic issues, deportations, you name it, the reasons that they moved a lot. So we said, well, let's start this center, bring together a social worker and bring together services to try to work with some of those things. Today, Webb's mobility rate is down significantly, and at all the schools where we've had centers, the mobility rate has dropped, and academic success at Webb has, you know, and it's not the only factor, but, it, but by stabilizing the school, we've been able to see the academic um, achievement go up, because now kids are in school ready to learn. And there's one thing I know about school reform, or school improvement, that is absolutely, unarguably true. If a kid is not in school, no matter how good the curriculum, the teacher, how safe the hallways are, how wonderful the, the extracurriculars are, if a kid is not in school, he or she can't learn. So our number one mission, I think, it, you know, above great teachers, above great curriculum, above all those other factors, they're really, they're vitally important, but we have to have, get kids in school ready to learn. And so that is, you know, our mission as an organization is to make sure kids are in school ready to learn. And I think that's the mission of today's event, is dealing with a piece of that. Through the Family Resource Centers, we deal with a piece of it, family instability. But there's this whole other piece of kids involved in a very broken attendance system in our district. I do a lot of work with schools. I was at a middle school, not Webb, was at another middle school last week, meeting with teachers, meeting with the principal and they have a very broken attendance system. Nobody could really tell you how to deal with kids that have multiple, um, uh, multiple misses in class. Um, so uh, you guys are gonna be, I, I think, again, focused on that. How do we get kids back in school ready to learn? I think it's very, very exciting. Um, right now, we are doing it in an awful way. A lot of our dropout um, prevention specialists are spending hours and hours in court every day. I see them all the time coming back. Um, Reagan High School, the school I work with, had a, this was a record for them, but they referred over 400 kids one month. This was about three years ago. They had a dropout prevention specialist. He was about to quit. He was frustrated. He just, he said, I'm literally going to just refer every kid exactly as I'm supposed to. I'm going to follow the letter of the law. He referred over 400 kids and quit. <laughs> You know, and of course, the court had a meltdown at the same time doing that. But, but you're going to be helping fix that, that attendance system uh, with, with what you're doing. And, um, and I just say to you, what we need to do is stop using the courts as our attendance system. We've got to fix it within and make sure our schools are handling it within the schools. So, yes? Um, if the problems that are causing a large part of the mobility are deportations, people moving, Jobs and um, cheaper apartments and stuff. Which is really how does the community um, center stop that? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons that people move. Yeah. So if, if if a family is moving because of you know rent problems, mm -hmm. um, a lot of families don't know how to work with their their landlords. And so we do that, and we'll work with the Austin Tenants Council. What we're looking for, our goal is not to solve problems. And I don't think your goal should be to solve the world's problems. Your goal, my goal, should be getting kids in school ready to learn every day. And so, so it's finding ways to make sure that the family doesn't move, at least move that school year is what we're doing. Um, deportations are difficult because we've had cases where kids get left behind. Um, parents, adults are deported, and you've got kids left with friend or a cousin, and, and I mean, it's some very, very, I know, I know Adrian, you deal with situations like this, I'm sure that they're extremely messy, um, and, they, and they need somebody to, to really come aside the kid, and, 
and stabilize that. I, but, yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. Sure. I'm just, um, it just seems like ma magic. I, how much have you um, brought the mobility down from these kind of uh, advocacy? Web right now is right about 29% from 35, so we consider that. There's a, there's, a, there's a statistic that we haven't learned to measure yet. That, that rate, is a, it's a snapshot at the end of September and in June. It's a comparison to school on both dates. But there's mobility within the school year. Kids literally go and come and go and come back, and that's not measured. But we know just anecdotally that that is significantly down. Teachers tell us that kids, you know, they're, they're just not moving nearly as much during the school year. So, um, so that's been, um, so I want to mention two other things and I'll sit down, is that the district is working on some good things. One is through the joint subcommittees. Each, the city, county, school district, each have a subcommittee. They get together, it's the joint subcommittees um, to talk about issues of common concern. And um, they have, they found it a couple of years ago, and Adrian, I think you probably sat on that, the, the truancy, the juvenile justice task force, um, where the kind of things you're going to be diving into, um, they've been trying to address. And uh, we've got a pilot in the Reagan High School feeder pattern right now um, of some, some trying to simplify some of the court referral process. Um, I'll also mention what Tina does with Webb Middle School. Um, the UT School of Law, three years ago? now, three years ago, founded a youth court at Webb, and that has been fantastic, and I, I think in helping kids really begin to understand, um, you know, the legal process, and begin to, begin to kind of get how to, how to um, well, okay. Tina, why don't you say a word, just a second. Um, so our program is meant to address school admissions pipeline by offering them And what we do is we basically set up a peer, kind of a peer mediation, peer, um, peer model where a student who gets a disciplinary referral can opt to go to youth court instead of going to ISS where they're going to be out of the classroom all day. And um, over the last three years, we've involved, we've evolved to include a lot of restorative justice principles. So we teach our kids who run the youth court um, how to hear some of that. So the student who has a referral comes before their peers and they're represented by a peer, and the, you know, they're basically, there's a hearing where they talk about, okay, well, why why are you, you know, disrespecting your teacher, what's going on, and the kids ask sort of critical questions to get to the root of what's actually the problem. Sometimes it's that the kid doesn't understand what's going on in school, and it's frustrated. Um, we also have kids who interview the teachers and ask the teachers, well, what's going on in the class? What did you do to kind of try to fix the situation, et cetera? And then the kids come up with a consequence that they feel is meaningful. That could be writing a letter of apology to the teacher or writing a reflective essay on, you know, why, you know, it's important to be um, participating in class. And we feel like this kind of measure, you know, helps peers hold themselves accountable to their community. It teaches citizenship, but also, most importantly, what it does is it keeps them out of suspension and expulsion. So it keeps them in the classroom. Yeah. And we've had a lot of success. This is Meg Clifford. She's our school decision pipeline fellow, and she's um, implementing the program. So it's one small little program that's meant to really try to get it. Just doing doing great work at Web. So I'll sit down now. And <coughs> Brian, next speaker. Thank you, Alan, for that that great snapshot of what's going on in Austin in this one. Um, next. We're going to have uh, attorney Selena Marina from the Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid talk to you about um, Texas Education Code and kind of larger phenomenon in the state. So, with that, Selena. First of all, just thank you everybody for coming and showing an interest in this issue. Just to get a sense uh, who's in the room, how many uh, people here are attorneys? So I just want to kind of expand a little bit on, on the context, um, talk about some of the trends going on in the school to prison pipeline. I think everybody pretty much knows what that is here. Um, but to kind of get a, a sense, uh, well, let me back up and say, uh, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid represents um, a 68 county service area 
in, uh, in Texas, and we take on, um, for direct representation, the kind of cases that we're hoping that you guys will take, um, representing kids <coughs> in these Class C misdemeanor school ticketing cases and from um, the, the start of, of when somebody's charged, but also we try to look at uh, what's going on in kids' life in a more comprehensive way. So not only looking at the, the Class C case, uh, but also is this child needing special education services that um, he or she's not being provided? Um, is this child a, a, you know, experiencing homelessness uh, due to domestic violence? Um, all questions that when you're looking at these cases, um, you kind of want to flag, um, is this child in foster youth, that kind of thing. Um, so just really, really, really excited that y'all are um, taking such a great interest in this. Um, when we think of the school to prison pipeline, a lot of times you, you think about it um, in a more traditional sense, in a linear sense, where a child first gets in trouble um, by going to the detention, um, going to after school detention or getting suspended, then um, even more trouble may be put into alternative school. Um, and then later down the line in the juvenile justice system, and by the time that child is an adult, uh, that child is now, um, that, that person is now uh, in the adult criminal system. But since the, the mid-90s, that phenomenon has kind of shifted. Um, and these are the kind of cases that we're hoping you're going to take. Um, the, the adult system has now been um, used as a tool. Um, you might have heard the, the expression, passing the paddle, where uh, there's a critique that, that schools are passing the responsibility to discipline um, from the classroom to the, the courtroom. And so you'll have a judge uh, handling um, a problem that, that the principal um, should probably be handling. And so you're seeing kids get put into these justice of the peace, JP, and municipal courts, uh, which are adult courts. They are not juvenile courts. And so these kids are ended up with adult criminal records. Um, so a 12-year-old getting in, in trouble for missing school is ending up with an adult criminal record, which uh, Brian alluded to, that, that has some uh, pretty detrimental uh, implications down the line. What are some of the, the big trends going on in, in the school to prison pipeline? Uh, well, right now about 300,000 of these ticketing cases are being filed every year in Texas. Um, so an exorbitant number, and um, unfortunately once you're ticketed, you're much more likely to drop out. Um, there's also a lot of disproportion in how these cases are filed. And so you'll see black and to a lesser extent Latino students being overrepresented as well as uh, kids who are in special education classes or uh, receiving those services. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a very exact sense of, of where these tickets, uh, what kind of tickets, um, you know, the, we don't have a lot of disaggregated data uh, for these cases because there is no legislative mandate um, on, on tracking this very specific data. Um, and I know that a lot of great organizations uh, that do a lot of research, like Texas Appleseed, um, are pushing for some of those reforms um, because it's hard to, to fix the problem when we, we don't fully understand it. Um, but we do understand from, from the research that is out there um, that there's disproportion and that most of these cases are actually being filed for nonviolent behavior. Um, and so that's something that is uh, really troubling when you, when you think about the uh, long-term consequences it can have. Because think about when you, back when you were in middle and high school, um, and you know, we all misbehaved at one point, and you know, there, we, don't, we, we wouldn't be here, I don't think, um, today had there have been such strict laws the way that there are now. Um, at least I'm speaking for myself. I probably would not be here. <laughs> uh, so another trend that we're seeing is an increase in police presence. So with that increase, not surprisingly, you're seeing this huge increase in school ticketing cases. Um, and I just want to, you know, food for thought. Um, right now in Texas, there's one police officer for every 250 kids. Um, and just kind of think about when you're in school, or maybe your kids that are in school, think about how many counselors there are, uh, what ratio there is for, for every child. I know in my high school, it was probably one to 500, one to 700, something like that. 
Um, and so, you know, in terms of where we're putting our resources as a state, um, that's something that, you know, we want to be thinking about. Um, so why does this matter? Uh, Brian alluded a little bit to it. Um, this matters because, let me, let me paint a picture since you did a good job of already kind of talking about what the consequences are for job applications and for um, applications to college having this adult criminal record. Um, I have a client who, at Texas uh, Rio Grande Legal League, we have a program um, where we represent youth experiencing homelessness all the way up until age 23. And so we get to see some of the cases uh, when the kids are a little bit older and already into adult, early adulthood and, and how that is impacting their lives. So I had a client, for example, that, um, who was experiencing homelessness that had a charge you know, several years back and for something, that, uh, misbehavior in school. And you know that that charge stayed on his record and prevented him from from getting a job. Um, it was a, a, a theft charge for stealing makeup, and something that and theft in, in Class C cases are it's theft under fifty dollars. So we're not talking about you know going and um, cleaning out Lancome. Like we're talking about um, some pretty petty theft. That, um, that kind of charge can really hinder somebody's ability to get a job. And in, in my client's case was, was kind of maintaining his status as um, you know, somebody experiencing homelessness. Um, another example is when, when this charge, let's say it's an assault charge that a kid gets for um, making a threat, uh, saying I'm gonna kick your butt uh, in, in school that can be charged as an assault um, by threat, even though there was no touching uh, or anything. That, that's uh, a case that I had. Um, this kid was charged with, with uh, assault, and when, when it shows up on your record, uh, you're not seeing a, a distinction between assault, domestic violence, felony, and assault, class C. Sometimes mm -hmm. on your record, you'll just see assault. And so you can, you can imagine what kind of impact that has um, on a child later as an adult. Another thing is once that child turns 17, if they're charged fines, and you can get charged fines up to $500 in these, these cases for each offense, if those fines are not paid by the time um, that person turns 17, a warrant can be issued for that person's arrest. And so you're talking about missing school, you're talking about I'm going to kick your butt, um, pretty minor stuff, and it can lead to somebody's arrest. So what are some of the most common offenses? I mentioned assault. Um, so there's assault by threat, and so you might see one of those cases. You might see assault by physical contact, where that's literally if I just, let's just say I'm, I'm mad at Principal McGivern, and I you know, kind of push past, past him. I don't hurt him, but I push past him. Um, maybe maybe I'm a child with an emotional disability, and um, I get charged. And we've seen that so many times. Um, you know, that's an example of assault by by physical contact, where a child can be uh, charged with a class C misdemeanor in adult court. Um, of course, the most common one is is one that um, you know Mr. Weeks spoke about, which is failure to attend school. And I'll talk about that in, in just a little bit uh, in more detail. Um, one of the ones that I personally think it needs to be off the books is a dis disruption of class and disruption of transportation. Um, kids are getting charged for, uh, and you've probably seen some of these stories on the news, um, Appleseed, Texas Appleseed has done some articles, uh, been, been featured in some articles on this. Um, kids, from kids chewing gum to burping in class to slamming a door. Um, to spraying perfume, um, all of these things are being considered disruption of class um, or disruption of transportation. Um, and I know those sound like, oh, she's just throwing out some very extreme cases, but you'd be so shocked how common um, we see these types of, of charges filed. Um, disorderly conduct is another one where, you know, if I flick off Mr. McG Principal McGivern over here, um, I can be charged with disorderly conduct. Um, so those are the those are some of the more common ones, and, and also theft, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but there is some good news uh, coming out of the legislature this last session. Um, 
in, in the failure to attend school cases. And I think that that's something that when, when you're taking on one of these cases, you really want to look for. Because it's one thing to have a, a law in place, and it's another thing to make sure that it's being followed. And so one, one new change in the law uh, for these failure to, to attend school cases is that now before a, a school files a charge, um, a truancy charge on, on a child, um, they have to do what's called truancy prevention measures. Um, that the law is extremely vague on what that actually means, um, but it can be, what, what I've seen in practice and what you might see is some districts, some schools, and um, I think AISD is probably um, more progressive than some of the more rural counties that we see sometimes, um, where their truancy prevention measure is, um, here's the law, hope you understand it. Um, you know, we told you about the law, there's your truancy pre prevention measure. Uh, there are some districts, um, however, that are doing a lot more uh, where they might do a needs assessment with, with the child before filing charges on, that, on that, youth, that particular youth where they're saying, okay, what's going on at home? Um, do you need to meet with a counselor? We're gonna have you meet with a counselor, uh, figure out what are the underlying issues um, in your life. And, and so that's something that when you're when you're working with these these youth um, to really push push the schools on and and when you're talking to a prosecutor um, in, in negotiation really pushing the issue is this school really in fact um, trying to prevent this truancy or are they just filing cases does the law um, say that the truancy prevention measures have to be for kids rather than just like having a school that with the truancy prevention that's a, that's a good question. So in every single complaint um, that's, that's written, um, the school has to say two things. One, whether that child is eligible or receiving special education services, and two, what truancy permission, prevention measures were taken with that, with that child. Mm -hmm. um, another new change in the law is that now um, for, for several different offenses, um, disruption of classes, disruption of transportation, and disorderly conduct, um, you can, you have to be, um, you can't, if you're in the sixth grade or younger, the school can no longer bring charges against you. So that's kind of, um, you know, there, I, I, I think it should be older, um, in fact, it, my, my personal opinion uh, is that some, these kind of cases shouldn't be in these courts at all, but it is slow progress. Um, There's a nice, a nice visual for you on disruption of class. And that's, this is uh, emitting a noise of an intensity that prevents or hinders classroom instruction. Is, that's part of the law, what you could be charged for. And so the reason I, I, I put this up here is um, just so you can see how very, very broad the law is. And the reason that's important is because when you have a law that is so broad, that's where you're going to start seeing your disproportion. That's where you see your abuse of discretion. That's where you're seeing... I mean, I think that that, that might be why, um, you know, kids that are, you know, some teachers say harder to teach um, are more likely funneled into the school to prison pipeline. How are we doing on time? I know, I know Randy's going to talk some more about some practical points. Okay. Sure. So what are some, some policy solutions that, that have been advocated? Um, one, like I said, is just to eliminate school-based ticketing, uh, period. Or at least, uh, like Austin ISD has done, is adopt a policy making ticketing uh, a policy of last resort. Like I said, that's a great policy. I think y'all are going to see cases um, and, and decide whether or not that policy is being implemented. I hope that it is. Um, Another thing is is really pushing um, the districts to to keep this data and removing financial incentives um, on a policy level to um, to file the charges because on if you're when when uh, parents are getting filed on for their kids absent and excused absences um, half of that money goes to the courts and half of it goes back into the school district system and so really removing those financial incentives is a, would be 
um, is a start that a lot of organizations have advocated for. Um, what we see um, at Legal Aid a lot that where, where kids get into uh, have problems is in our special education cases where um, police officers are not properly trained on how to work with students with disabilities. Um, and so rather than de-escalate a situation, that situation gets escalated and the child is, is charged with um, you know, assaulting a police officer, which is actually a higher than Class C, or you know, maybe it'll be charged as an assault or disorderly conduct. And that's an area that when you're when you're in negotiations with um, you know prosecutors, you can bring that up. What is you know what happened here in this situation? Um, this particular school, you know, police officer is not trained in de-escalation. Um, one other thing that is a huge, uh, has been a, a huge success in schools is positive, it's called PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention and Supports, where rather than uh, use a punitive method of discipline, you're implementing a, um, a, an academically researched and, and behavioral supports that um, fit for all kids. Um, and so that's something that, you know, remember PBIS for when you're working with, in these cases. Um, because that's something to advocate for as the pro bono project you know, uh, continues to move forward. Um, students with disabilities have additional due process rights, and so uh, they, when, when a kid is disciplined and removed from the classroom, you have to have um, a conference where the school asks, was this child's behavior related to their disability? And if so, um, you cannot punish them the same way um, that you would any other child. And this is important for the, the criminal context because if you have, for example, a, a student um, whose school itself has said, okay, this was related to this child's um, post-traumatic stress disorder or Tourette's syndrome, um, you can go and then take that to the prosecutor and almost always you will see a dismissal uh, of the, those charges. So even if you're not actually taking on a special education case, you want to keep those questions in mind. And I will leave the practice points for Randy, who, who also uh, accepts for direct representation a lot of these cases. Thank you again so much. And so for our final speaker today, we have Randy Langford, criminal defense attorney, who will talk to you about defense and uh, also restorative justice. Randy. Did, uh, I produced a couple of documents, and I think they're going to be disseminated to y'all after, uh, after our meeting today. And uh, hopefully you'll remember a little bit of what I said and look over them. If you have any questions about them, then feel free to call me up and uh, we can discuss them in greater detail. But what I'm going to visit with you about today is just a bare bones guide to representing kids who have been charged in municipal or justice courts. And uh, Selena did a great job of giving you examples of some of the cases and charges that might be brought against a minor or a student uh, in these courts where Class C misdemeanors are are addressed. Uh, the first thing that you're going to, can y'all hear me okay? Okay. First thing that you're going to deal with, uh, obviously, is the fact that these are criminal cases, that all the disabilities that go along with being charged with and or convicted of a criminal case apply in, in these Class C misdemeanors. So even though they're, only, they're fine only offenses, there are some substantial consequences that can go along with them. So they need to be taken serious, uh, seriously by the attorneys and you need to encourage your clients to take them seriously as well. Oftentimes they don't. And uh, that, that's something that you'll learn to do to try to, to um, emphasize to them the seriousness of being charged with a Class C misdemeanor later on in life if they do end up with a conviction. Um, Ms. Selena talked about the, the, um, these cases 
or Class C misdemeanors, fine only offenses, however, in certain circumstances, and they're governed, governed by Chapter 45 in the Code of Criminal Procedure, under certain circumstances, they can result in jail time. The defendant is over a certain age, um, and they do certain things in regard to the disposition of their case. So, uh, Chapter 45, um, I believe it's uh, 050, 45.050 addresses those circumstances. You need to take a look at that uh, whenever you're um, considering the, the particular defendant and their ability to follow through with any agreement that you may reach with the court or with the prosecution. They can be charged with a citation, written a ticket, turned loose, given a date to appear in court. Under other circumstances, uh, they may be arrested or at least uh, put under what's called non-secure custodian care, custodial care, which basically means being locked in a room for some period of time um, until lawyers are called in, parents are notified, or something like that. So um, if they're 17 years age, of age or older, they could be placed under arrest for a Class C misdemeanor. There are only two Class C misdemeanors in the penal, penal code for which you cannot be arrested if you agree to sign a citation, and that is speed, one is speeding and the other is dry, operating a vehicle with an open container of alcohol. For other, most other Class C misdemeanors, you can be arrested if you do not consent to signing the citation if it's offered to you. Um, the, uh, you guys will be assigned students who have probably been written, been issued citations for some offense. And the first thing that you'll need to do is meet with those students, and preferably, if you can, meet with their parents or parent, and sit down and gather as much information as you can about these kids. Personal information, how they're doing in school, the um, environment at home, what the particular structure of their family is, siblings, all that kind of information because it might make a difference when it comes to uh, the time when you sit down and visit with the prosecutor. The next thing you'll do after you gather all that information is you'll write a letter of representation to the court, notifying the court that you now are attorney of record for this student and for all notices to be sent to you. What that will do is, and oftentimes, not in every time, but in most jurisdictions, that will move the case off of what's considered uh, a pro se docket um, onto the attorney appearance docket, which typically are different dockets um, and courts handle them differently. Um, once you're notified of a court date, depending on the jurisdiction and the court where your case is being heard, will determine whether or not the student needs to be present with you when you show up. For most alcohol-related offenses, uh, minor in consumption, minor in possession, that type of stuff, the, uh, most courts require the student or your, your minor client to be present with their lawyer for those dockets. And usually what will happen at those uh, settings is you'll um, be called up to the bench by the judge and the judge will take off their judicial robe and they'll put on their parents cap and they will give a stern talking to your client and you don't need to be too concerned about that or too defensive about it as long as the judge doesn't cross that line of protocol and procedure and start talking about specific facts of the case and asking him about that. If the judge does that, then you need to politely remind the court that your client is pleading not guilty to this offense and there's nothing to talk about when it comes to the, to the facts of the case. Um, but most of the time, they'll just um, wag their finger at your client and 
um, tell them they need to pay attention to their lawyer and be a good student and be a good son or daughter and pay attention to their parents and they'll see them back in at the next court setting. Once you've met with the judge, um, off, usually what will happen is, is your case will be reset and it'll be set on an attorney appearance docket as we've talked about and you'll have an opportunity to sit down and talk to the prosecutor at that time. In Travis County, the prosecutors are some, in, in justice courts are some of the most reasonable folks you'll ever sit down with to talk about a, a, a minor case, a case involving minors. And they understand the possible consequences and ramifications of having a conviction for any type of criminal offense on someone who uh, particularly who has received a citation for some behavior in school, um, like Selena was talking about, you know, assault, let's say, um, where it could be, you know, an offensive or provocative touching. Now, I don't, that seems to me like they'd have thousands of kids every day, you know, <laughs> charged with, with assault if they wanted to really, really press that, but they don't. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what could happen. So the prosecutors understand all that, and, and they're very deferential to the concerns of the um, defense lawyers and looking out for interest of the student or the child down the road. So most of the time, what they're going to um, do is want to immediately, at your first meeting, offer you what's called a deferred disposition of the case. We're going to talk about that just as, in a second because I'm going to tell you that as a, as a lawyer trying to do a good job for your client, this is where you want to thank them for their offer and ask them to write their offer down on the file cover and reset the case and give you an opportunity to review discovery that you're going to request from them. Because what you'll want to do is, is request at that time any discovery they have, which probably will only amount to a copy of the citation, maybe a complaint. Some of them might have some kind of probable cause affidavit, not very often. Um, and there, there might be, in some instances, there may be video surveillance of activity of the student in, in school. And you can ask for all of that. And they'll give you what they have right then and they'll check to see if they have any of it that they don't have right then, and you'll reset the case and come back. At the next setting when you go back to meet with the prosecutor, your client probably will not need to be present. You'll sit down with the prosecutor and they'll tell you whether or not any of the discovery that you requested is available, and whether or not they're gonna ask you to actually file a discovery motion to obtain any of it. Usually that would, uh, be in the case of where there is a videotape available, they might require you to actually file a motion for discovery and for the most part they won't contest it and the judge will order that videotape be produced. But go ahead and do all of that stuff because even though these cases will ultimately, most of them, be worked out in such a way that it uh, results in a dismissal for your, your client, you know, due diligence requires that we get all the discovery av available to us and that we actually look at it and see if our client is just out and out innocent of, of what they're being charged with, you know? I mean, there's no reason to have a young person go up there and plead to an offense, even if it's ultimately going to be dismissed, if they actually didn't do it. So we want to we want to um, do due diligence in our discovery and review the case and see what the facts reveal. Most of the time, the facts are going to reveal that the they support the charge or something close to it. Okay, and so once that if, if that becomes evident to us. What we want to do is go back and visit with the prosecutor this deferred disposition agreement that we have probably already been offered. And the deferred disposition agreements typically will require some amount of community service, um, usually some kind of counseling class 
whether it be alcohol counseling, um, anger management, something along those lines. And it will be for some period of time, typically 90 to 180 days, in which during that time period, if, the, if your client enters into this agreement and they successfully comply and complete the, comply with and complete the terms of the agreement, the case will be dismissed. And unlike a deferred adjudication agreement, which is similar to that for upper level offenses, class B uh, and up, a dismissal in those cases could not be expunged. For a class C misdemeanor, the records related to this case could be expunged as a result of a dismissal through a deferred disposition agreement. So that's what we're looking at. Now, <coughs> let's say you get a deferred disposition agreement for Johnny, and it requires Johnny to pay a $100 uh, deferral fee and $72 court cost and do 24 hours of community service and take an you know, alcohol education class. And Johnny doesn't do any of that stuff, or maybe not all of it. If at the end of the deferral period, they have not provided, pay, either paid the money or provided proof of completion of those uh, requirements, then they are gonna be sent a notice for what's called a show, show cause hearing. And the judge is gonna call them in and say, hey, why didn't you do this? And if they don't have a good, pretty good excuse as to why they didn't do it, um, the judge might adjudicate them at that time and find them guilty and assess a fine, which is probably gonna be a lot more money than whatever the fee was and the court costs that they were originally asked to pay as a, as a part of this uh, deferred disposition agreement. Most of the time though, the judges, even the lamest excuses will be accepted and they will be given another opportunity to complete and comply with the terms of the agreement. Um, and this you know, comes in where you guys would have to you know, forcefully urge them to do that and remind them of the consequences of a conviction uh, for these Class C misdemeanors. If they still don't com uh, comply with the, with the disposition agreement after they've been given this grace period, then they can be adjudicated, assessed a fine up to $500. Um, they can be found to be in contempt of court if they didn't pay that $500. Their case could be referred to juvenile, the juvenile justice system or the judge could, uh, the court could retain jurisdiction over the case and they might do things like um, issue an order that uh, kept the kid from getting a driver's license or suspended the driver's license if they had it as part of uh, being found in contempt. Um, most of the time, the, the courts will work with you and work with your client to see to it, or at least in Travis County, get out in other counties a little bit further north of here, you might have a different, uh, different experience. But in Travis County, most of the time, they're gonna work with you any way they can so that this kid does not have a, a conviction on their record. I'm sorry. Um, that uh, order is about driver's license. Mm -hmm. um, is that somewhere in the, in the statute? It, it is. It's. It's. Uh, I believe it's in uh, 45.050 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. And um, does it have to be somehow related, like an alcohol offense, or could you not get a license because you? If you are found to be in contempt of court, okay. Of yeah, they can do that. If you don't pay, if you don't pay your fine, if you. Okay. Uh, that's what. That's that, that's. Uh, you know, the court's remedy to address okay. those things. Thank you. Okay. Um, now let's just say. Johnny is as concerned about his future as you are, and he gets his, he finishes his community service quickly, and he does his counseling, and he pays his fees, and um, his case is dismissed. His case, this, that case then would then be eligible for all records related to it to be expunged. Now, Expunction law has become a little bit 
more technical than it once was. And so what I would, um, I'm not going to go into all the details of, of uh, filing an expunction petition and where it can be filed, whether it's in municipal court or whether it has to be filed in district court, but um, you would need to do your research, find that out, and ask your client, make sure that your client is aware of the fact that their case can be expunged, um, and then discuss with them what that would require, and I'm not sure about uh, how a ALG uh, would you know, deal with any of those types of situations, but um, that's certainly something that someone would want to have done, if, uh, particularly if any of these offenses involved assault, alcohol-related offense, offenses, things like that, where even the charge, even though the charge is shown to have been dismissed, the fact that they were charged with that offense could um, have an effect on employment, those types of things. Yeah. Lastly, but not leastly, and this is very important, you need to be aware that if your client um, is not a U.S. citizen, whether or not they're here as an undocumented immigrant or they're here on a green card or whatever their status is, certain of these offenses can have a detrimental effect on their immigration status simply by entering a plea. Let's just say, let me back up just a little bit. Let's say you have a client who was found to have drug paraphernalia on them at school, and they are charged with possession of drug paraphernalia. And you work out a sweet deal where they have a deferred disposition agreement, very little um, community service time, very low fee that they pay, and they do it all, comply with it all, and their case is dismissed. As part of that deferred disposition agreement, though, they must enter a no contest plea, okay? The Fifth Circuit has determined that that no contest plea is the same as a guilty plea. And they have also determined that Possession of drug paraphernalia, even though under Texas state law is a class C misdemeanor, under federal law, that's a felony. So the feds see it as a felony drug offense to which your client has pled guilty. Now, they could very well be deported based on that. So before you enter into any of those types of uh, deferred disposition agreements, it would, uh, you do well to either become personally educated as to immigration law or consult an immigration attorney to make sure that you're not advising your client to plead to something, enter into agreement that could cause them to be scooped up by INS and sent home. Any questions about any of this? So that brings us to the end of the presentation and you may be asking yourself, where do we go from here? Well, Right now, there is um, a trickle that will soon become a small stream of uh, referrals of these potential cases that are coming in through the Attorney Lawyers Guild's door. Um, there's a signing sheet that was passed around before where you had an opportunity to say whether or not you'd be interested in uh, looking at a referral. If you were, then your name's going to be added to a list that I've already been working on and that I'll be adding people to in the future, people who might be interested in taking on one of these cases. What that means is that when a case comes in my door, um, Depending on what it looks like, um, I'm going to contact one of you to ask you, would you be willing to take a look at this case, talk to this person, possibly represent this person? It's a non-binding commitment. Um, the cases are largely coming from, uh, coming from a number of sources, one through um, Costa of Travis County for foster kids, some through uh, Disability Rights Texas, which is a statewide organization but has a lot of referrals in the Austin area that they can't take, uh, can't take care of. I'm in any number of other sources. And so um, if you've been so foolish as to click check the, X, uh, check the yes box, um, I, uh, I will get in touch with you to see if that's something you'd uh, be willing to help out with. Uh, in the short term, I mean, that's going to be a major benefit for these kids. Like I said at the beginning of the, the presentation, it's, it's a relatively low commitment of time that has an enormous impact on a person's life. Uh, in the long term, we hope that everyone getting involved with this, all the attorneys who are willing to donate that small amount of time, um, 
that that will all lend a lot of force to uh, work that we're doing on the other end of this to try to encourage um, AISD in Austin to change some of its policies regarding the criminalization of school discipline. Like we said before, this is a, it's a relatively new phenomenon, and there's no reason why it can't be rolled back. So thank you all for coming here today, and um, I'll tell you what, I'll be in touch. And thank you again to Vasu and the good people at DLA Piper for making this amazing room and lunch and all of that available to us. This really probably wouldn't have happened otherwise, so thank you.